Emerging from the pandemic, a suitable agency began the series in collaboration with Sundha Nursery to celebrate the written word, the joy of reading and to facilitate closer interactions between writers and readers. We have been very fortunate to have had some of the most distinguished writers, artists and promising new voices join us in the conversations, suitable conversations. Today we are delighted to welcome two remarkable historians and authors, Sopna Niril, whose, le- whose latest book, The Broughton's Broken Script, and William Dalrymple, who has recently authored The Anarchy. They will, disca- they will discuss the fascinating history of Delhi between the Mughals and the British. The conversation today will be followed by a Q&A session, following which the writers will be happy to sign copies of the books that you might be carrying today. As always, I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners at Sundar Nursery, Datish Nanda, Hardeep Ji, Nidhi. We are extremely grateful for their continued support for the series. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for turning out on a Saturday afternoon when you could be, um, well, basking under the trees in the Sundar Nursery. So what a, a wonderful initiative this is by uh, Hemani and Smriti. Um, it's everything we all love about Delhi in one place. Some gorgeous architecture, perfect February, March weather, beautiful light, um, and the company of other book and history lovers. I think it's fair to say that, that Delhi has fewer fans than, than many other cities. Uh, um, it has a reputation for violence, for dirt, for pollution, uh, for... Uh, all the sorts of things that uh, uh, we um, uh, d- dislike, sitting in traffic jams and the bitchly going and all that. And yet, as we all know, behind that facade lies one of the most interesting cities in the world with one of the very richest and most sophisticated history, arts and culture. And this is something that Swapna has been working on uh, most of her adult life. This is her third book on Delhi. She started in Chanichak, worked around Connor Place, and now made it to Sunday Nursery, um, but with this spectacular book, which if any of you have not bought and read it yet, The Broken Script, go straight to Khan Market. Sadly, we can't um, buy or sell books in this space, but uh, go straight to Khan Market, uh, uh, to Farooq Chand or to uh, uh, Baris or wherever, Uh, and buy your copy, as it's an incredibly important book that brings together uh, years of archival research, um, along with uh, a deep, deep uh, erudition in all the secondary literature about this fascinating place. We first met about 2006 or 7 in the indexes of the National Archives. Um, We were both working at that time on Azurda. Uh, and the uh, and the luminaries uh, of the late Mughal court about whom we will be speaking over the next hours. And I think we were both very early stages of our research at that point. Swapna was doing her PhD. I was uh, just beginning work on, on Last Mughal, um, which uh, grew fatter and fatter as the archives uh, gave up their treasures. And I think both of us have found this city and its archives a source of endless stimulation, but also uh, uh, we've been felt, I think, both of us in different ways, crusaders for this city because so much is destroyed. Every time you go to the old city, another haveli has gone, uh, a car park is sitting, or a, or a concrete pile where uh, a beautiful mogul arch once sat or a jali screen once was. Uh, and um, also... The Mughals, in many ways, are dirty words uh, at the moment. And uh, there is no great Mughal museum left in this city, which is the most bizarre thing that in this, uh, this city built uh, and, and dominated by Mughals, you can't go and, and, and enjoy a Mughal museum um, and learn about the history. But it sends you back to the books and to the work of great scholars like Swapna. First thing I'd like to ask is what actually drew you to this period? Because it's a ne- relatively neglected period. The last great book before yours on this was really sort of personal sphere writing in the 1950s. Um, and there's been very, very little 
um, works uh, appreciating this period. I mean, these, you know, Shah Jahan, there's libraries, the Freedom Struggle, there's libraries, 1857, there's several libraries, but uh, the period you chose uh, is, is a relatively neglected one. Thank you so much, um, William. And before I go any further, a great thank you to the Suitable Agency for this wonderful event, for giving me the opportunity to be here and to speak to so many people. And I've met so many uh, old and new friends over here. It's absolutely lovely. And Sundar Nas for this lovely, lovely venue. It It is uh, it's just made for events like this, I think, where you can sit and talk and talk about culture, talk about books and reading in these beautiful surroundings. And we still... Uh, Sota Ras is actually good in any weather, but this is just about perfect, I think, for the moment. Uh, but <clears throat> yes, um, William and I met when we were we were doing this uh, research together in the National Archives. And uh, I don't think you are right when you say that you know uh, Delhi has been relatively less written about in um, uh, you know not not a lot of writing about the city has happened compared to say, for instance, even even uh, Calcutta. A lot more has been written about the city, and um, but I think, and I again think that uh, in the last two decades or so since that uh, you know time that I first became interested in this, things have changed, and I think uh, the crowd that is here today is also testament to that interest in Delhi. So, um, and by the way, I must say it's it's not just that there is no Mughal museum. There is no Mughal. There's no city museum in this city. There is no museum of Delhi in Delhi or anywhere else for that matter. So that that's absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, every little town has a city museum, and this doesn't. So anyhow, that is. <clears throat> those are the things that we have been facing over the last. We've been we've been uh, you know we've been growing. Looking at the city, its past, its future, its present. Um, as for my own interest in Delhi, I, I, I was a historian, and I must say that the uh, interest in Delhi, I've kind of stumbled into it because I um, started. I was working on all sorts of things. I was working. Uh, I did a MPhil dissertation on Malwa opium. I <laughs> did that. Yeah. <laughs> I did a. Uh, I started off a PhD on the thugs, uh, which I dropped out of. But then, uh, then I actually came into Delhi because I started doing these heritage walks. I became interested in the uh, in the heritage of Delhi and the need to preserve it. And I started exploring areas, and that involved doing a little bit of research when I did this. And uh, once that had started, I decided that I wanted to do some work on Delhi, and. Uh, the 19th century is, is a very, very personal choice because just 19th century is a period of history I'm comfortable with. A lot of it has to do with language also. If I go too much to the back, and I was doing a PhD, remember, I was not writing just a book, I was doing a PhD. If you have to go back, then you have to um, you know, learn Persian, you have to learn Farsi. And I ha did not have that background in, uh, in uh, early modern history or medieval history. So um, it was, uh, you know, uh, I just said 19th century is a period I'm comfortable with. So I'll do the 19th century. As it happened, it was a very interesting period. So, um, you know, but I must say 19th century, when we begin to talk and today our conversation is about the company period in Delhi. And I think, um, you know, I, of course, my book goes right into it. But I think a lot of the 19th century the 18th century background is very important, isn't it? I mean, you know, a lot of it, uh, you know, there's some lot of context is interesting. So maybe you can, uh, you know, you, that's what your interest has been lately also, to look at the 18th century and what that has to tell us about what happened later. You begin your, your book, 1803 is the, the start date. Do you want to just give us a portrait of Delhi immediately before that, before the company turns up? What's been going on in Delhi? We all know about the great days of Shah Jahan and so on, but this is a very different Delhi by 1800. Every, every manner of catastrophe has been visited on the city. Give us a little picture of the city at that period. Um, the 18th century, of course, uh, well, is, is, is uh, in Indian history a very interesting period. I mean, there is... Uh, uh, with the slow disintegration of the Mughal Empire, uh, 
the rise of many of these so-called what we were taught in our history books uh, to refer to as the successor states. So many of those successor states are coming up. All the um, the the companies, the foreign powers are coming in. The Portuguese come in, the Dutch come in, the East India Company, the, the British, English East India Company, the French East India Company. And and that uh, leads even in Delhi. Delhi has, of course, uh, you know, it's less connected at that point with what is happening on the coast and the companies, etc. But it has its own, um, it's, uh, you know, there is the Marathas who are, increasingly playing an important role in North India. Uh, somebody like uh, Dolat Rao Sindhya comes to actually be the de facto governor, uh, I mean the ruler of, I mean the administrator, shall we say. They still ruled on behalf of the Mughal emperor, but the Marathas were the actual rulers of the city. So uh, a lot of change has already happened there. Mughal, the Mughal empire as empire is not there anymore, but it still has a very, very strong symbolic value. Would you talk about that? What What is left? So, I mean, obviously, the great armies, the treasury, all that has long disappeared. Even the Pietra Dura in the marble has been picked out. But what is left of the aura of that? Yeah. Why does anyone bother with any? What is left is a sort of interesting consensus in the sub large parts of the subcontinent, a consensus which recognizes the Mughals as the fount of authority, as the source of sovereignty. And therefore, anybody who wants to rule, and that includes the Marathas, by the way, now, who are often in, in historical accounts pitched as some uh, movement against uh, Mughal rule, and to some extent they are, but they, in their coins, uh, for instance, carry the name of the Mughal emperors because... Why is that? Why would they do that? Because there is this, as I said, there's a consensus. There is a, you know, among the people, among every little zamindar that is there who has a little land holding, there is this idea that you have the legitimacy to rule has to come from the Mughal emperor. And there's this extraordinary moment when when Shah Alam, a few years before this, has come up from Allahabad, where he's escaped the cage of the East India Company, and against everyone's advice, he's gone up the country, and he's worried about the reception he's going to get in Delhi because it's it's a city that's been destroyed first by Afghans, then by the Marathas, then back and forth. But when he writes, Dalit Rao Sindhya bows down. And, and, and offers his fealty. Again, explain that, because it's so against what most people would assume from what they know of the Marathas and the Mughals. Yes, because it is not because Dalit Rao, because Dalit Rao Sindhya also recognizes the symbolic power of the Mughals. The fact that he is seen to be giving proper respect to the throne, uh, you know, is important for his reputation in the areas around and all of these things used to get reported by the way I mean you know everybody whatever is happening in you we didn't have TV then but uh, there are these newsletters which are sending out all this information you know today the, the social uh, media of their day yeah uh, exactly uh, these are these uh, Persian newsletters which are uh, being circulated so whatever goes on is reported in the wider world so you have to be show, seen to be being, you know, to be properly respectful of the uh, presence. So then in 1803, the company chooses to go to war with the Marathas and, and it successfully divides Sindhya from Holka, yeah. takes out first one, then the other, yeah. and it arrives in Delhi as the new protector, in inverted oh, commas, yeah. of Shah Alam. What, what difference does that make at first? Um, I think for a long time there is no difference because... Uh, you know, the the company, of course, was also uh, very much involved in, uh, you know, the Maratha conflict with the Marathas was not over yet. There's a, still a lot going on and there, there, that continues till, uh, you know, 1818, I guess. And so all of that is still uh, happening. So uh, initially their whole idea is to keep old systems going, also conciliate a lot of people, you know. Uh, in fact, 
this is something that people often don't realize. A lot of the local zamindaris, the local princely states, Firozpur, the state of Firozpur Churka, the state of Patodi, these were all creations of the British. So they are uh, building up these uh, little clients around. Firozpur in Haryana, yeah. which is also the family uh, related to Ghalib. Yes. Ghalib's wife in from. Yes, yes, exactly. So. All of this, uh, initially, there is not very much change, right? And uh, it, it's only, um, in fact, a lot of the change begins to set in with the 1818, after 1818. Let's look at that initial period first, though. So describe the nature of the company officials who arrived. Because we have you know, a very um, straightforward Bollywood idea of what colonialism means, what... Uh, uh, what the the British with a capital B mean, but people like Octoloni and Fraser who arrive at the beginning are very different characters to a uh, sort of Kipling or a Curzon. In in what way are they different? Uh it is. I think the main thing about Fraser and Octoloni and other people like that, and you've dealt with some of that in White Bogal, <clears throat> is that these are people who have, from a very young age, been in India. And according to me, one thing that was also important is that they were in an India at a time when there are a lot of, you know, the East India Company is not paramount. There are many, many states who, uh, and they spent their early careers, uh, Octolodi, for instance, is, is you know, is uh, they're attached to these different uh, uh, states and different courts. And they, that, for, that gives them a very different sort of cultural uh, um you know, engagement, I think, with um, yeah. with uh, Indian society, which you brought out so well. And, uh, you know, you, you when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, you uh, definitely in White Mughal, a lot of that was addressed, but also in some of the other work that you've done, which is in the visual culture, for instance, the patronage of the arts. I don't go very much into that, but you've, you've done a lot about it. Stuff that I love, the way that you find... The early British friends, this is before evangelical Christianity kicks in, before utilitarianism kicks in, and before sort of power has totally corrupted them. You get in Delhi these characters like Octoloni and Fraser who are enamoured of the city. They love what they see. They're dazzled by it. And although it's poor and although it's run down, there's letters surviving from William Fraser writing home. And he says, he's been in Delhi about six months, and he says, I can't believe the riches. So... Every palace is in ruins. There are these treasures. And he's talking about men like Ghanid, these incredibly well-educated, incredibly refined men who know their history, who can recite this poetry. And also there are these artists, the family of Ghulam Ali Khan, the family of Mazar Ali Khan, uh, working for the court. But now, because the court haven't got the money to keep them alone, moonlighting with people like James Skinner, William Fraser, and producing fantastic masterpieces out of these ruined palaces, this crumbled walls, the, this collapsed city. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the things that draws me back to this period, is that in the ruins, in the in these broken courtyards, there is such talent. Uh, Incidentally, it's interesting, uh, and people may not uh, at first, uh, you know, think about this, but all our... <clears throat> before modern photography comes in, all our record of the buildings of Delhi, the spectacular monuments, as we call them today, of Delhi, are from these uh, company period drawings, these company paintings, because before that there wasn't a great Mughal tradition of painting buildings in a realistic manner. So all of that record, really, that rich visual record that we have of what Delhi was like, uh, uh, you know, during the last period of the Mughals is, comes from this and there is really nothing before that uh, that is there. Yutaka Sharma, who's a wonderful scholar who's, who's worked on this um, very specifically, think that the young Ghulam Ali Khan, as a young man, was a part of the entourage of the Daniels when they came to do their engravings mm -hmm. and that they had a camera obscura and that he yeah. learned how to pay, how to draw buildings by watching the Daniels do this. And many of the standard patterns that you get for company school paintings, they, they churn out these things rather like you could buy to, you know, postcards or old vectors today. Um, 
they would produce multiple copies which could be bought by visitors uh, and that these these start off life as Daniel Prince and then he adapts them and, and then develops his own style. Exactly and I, I think there are some uh, you know there's one which I always look at which is the uh, the painting of the Qudsi Abag which is, is so much a copy of what the five years did you know the perspective and everything. I could see back in those days, incredibly grand, the Queen Mother's yeah. residence on the Jamna. Yeah. So uh, this is, I think, a interesting, one very, very important part of the culture of this period. And by culture, I'm talking about the culture with a small c, is that of um, collaboration. There are you know, there is, um, uh, there are in some of it is institutional, like uh, you have your, uh, the Delhi College, which is in fact, uh, the first Western style institution that is set up in Delhi, an institution of higher learning. And uh, that is a place where you have, um, and it's not just, it's not a one way affair, there is engagement. There is engagement, there is, and you know, Delhi already had a, a, you know, established tradition of learning. There are very, very well educated uh, scholars who are passing and, you know, despite the disruption that had happened in the 18th century, we had a lot of people who were, who had carried on these uh, traditions of learning. There were people who, um, uh, who had regular day jobs who would in their free time teach people. So even though schools had fallen off, uh, the colleges were in poor shape, there was still a lot of intellectual uh, vibrancy that was still there. So for this kind of a population, a well-educated, well, -educated, well uh, uh, you know, aware population, a cosmopolitan population also, the idea that you have is more open to uh, new influences. I, th I think this point is well worth emphasizing because again, today there's often a view that the great period of, uh, of, of Indian learning is in the darkest antiquity and that the, the light goes out during the mobile period. But that's not at all the impression you get actually from sources at the time. I, I'm just going to read to you William Sleeman, the, he of the, of, the, of, the, of the thugs, you know, the thugs uh, you, uh, you abandoned. And... Um, he comes to Delhi, and this is what he writes. He's no, he's no Indophile. Sleeman is a critical uh, observer, and he's not a Fraser or an Octoloni. He's a, he's a prickly and difficult man. But here's what he says about the education in Delhi in the 1830s. He says, perhaps there are few communities in the world among whom education is more generally diffused than among the Mohammedans of India. And this he's writing in Delhi about specifically Delhi. He who holds an office worth only 20 rupees a month commonly gives his sons an education equal to one of our prime ministers. They learn through the medium of Arabic and Persian language what the young men of our colleges learn through those of Greek and Latin, that is grammar, rhetoric and logic. After seven years of study, the young Mohammedan binds his turban upon a head almost as filled with things which appertain to these branches of knowledge as the young man raw from Oxford. He will talk fluently about Socrates and Aristotle, Plato and Hippocrates, Galen and Abigena, but call them instead Socrates, Aristotelis, Aflatun, Bocrat, Jalinus and Bualicina. And what is much to his advantage in India, the language in which he has learned this, are those that he will be able to require during his public life. Um, very uh, that that's yep. Yeah, I, I think that sums up uh, to a large extent what the, uh, I've been trying to say. And uh, I go a step further. And uh, what was happening in this period also was that not only was this great tradition there, which was carrying on, but there was a lot of churning. It didn't stop there. It didn't stop at. So you have. For instance, uh, the person that I talk about quite frequently is Master Ram Chandar, for instance, the scholar. Of and the, an illustrator in your lovely picture which I'd never yeah. seen before is his algebra. Yeah. Yes. So he uh, he was a mathematician who was a product of the Delhi College. He had studied English at the Delhi College, um, and uh, he was a uh, He was a science teacher at the Delhi College as well, and he was really 
he he was a fascinating man because he uh, contributed and actually founded two science journals where he wanted to popularize science he talked about uh, uh modern scientific discoveries in the west about uh, all sorts of issues about people he wanted to bring about this uh, you know and, and so these are these people who are actually engaging with the new learning that is coming in also and want to diffuse that he also there is uh, not only uh, this kind of scientific and modern learning being taught in uh, the delhi college and propagated through popular journals but there are issues that are being discussed on things like social reform and uh, master ranchandar is again at one at the forefront of some of these kind of uh, you know he's he's talking he's a rationalist to begin with and he talks about religion and what's wrong with religion and the kind of uh, falsehood according to him which religion spreads so so these are inquiring minds who are actually coming out and uh, discussing and there is matter of freedom yes of course of inquiry which yes. is surprising yes and they are they are talking about all of this so it is a very very vibrant place and uh, at most i i, I if there are small uh, this uh, you know thing snippet that i always think it's emma roberts who's a who writes wonderfully about this period in india as a whole uh, the british traveler the, the right. british traveler yes and she writes this wonderful uh, she says that in delhi she's surprised that so far from calcutta she she's traveled up country as they used to call it and she comes to delhi and she suddenly sees that there's these colonial buildings you know these there are these neoclassical uh, pediments and <laughs> things that people are experimenting with there are mughal princes who are building the, in the know, red fort in the red fort they are building buildings which are uh, you know western uh, inspired so uh, so there is this great openness that is there to new influences there's a, there's some lovely stuff at this period you get the impression of delhi sucking in the talent from the country around it um and there's these nice accounts of uh, al kaf hussein hali uh, who flees his marriage in panipat and he escapes at night and walks 35 miles to delhi alone and penniless and sleeping rough in an attempt to realize his dream of studying in the famous colleges everyone wanted me to write for look for a job he wrote later but my passion for learning prevailed uh, and then he gives an idea of what of what he's come to he says delhi was a celebrated intellectual center had 16 sorry had six famous madrasas at least four small ones nine newspapers in urdu and persian five intellectual journals published out of delhi college numerable printing presses and 150 unani doctors um but he, the biggest draw of all he says are the poet and the intellectuals which we haven't yet touched upon men such as galib zork sabai and azurda by some good fortune wrote gali the red ali they gathered at this time in the capital delhi a band of men so talented that their meetings and assemblies recalled the great days of akbar and shah jahan uh yeah uh, hali of course is a very interesting man because he comes to delhi he does not study in the delhi college he studies in a traditional madrasa he says that in our madrasa the general opinion was that uh, the standard of the arabic and persian taught in the delhi college was not good not up to it up to the mark but anyway that was not the point of the delhi college it was meant to be essentially <clears throat> for the, the new learning of english yes um um but hali i think to some extent is also a little misleading because uh, again there is um, one of the things that drew me to this period was the very very conflicting views we often have of it because at one you know there is that whole sense of nostalgia uh which comes later uh, the later writing the later summing up of this period that happens after 1857 tends to um, romanticize this period as a period of the mughal high point uh, not high point at twilight but uh, you know a pristine mughal culture which 1857 suddenly destroys so the idea that there was a lot of ferment that there was a lot of questioning is often uh, glossed over and one of the things that i've attempted really in this book is to 
think of, uh, you know, look closely at some of the great minds of that time and what they are doing and saying. And these are people in uh, the field of Urdu poetry. These are people in the field of, of intellectual life of all sorts. And there is, in fact, a great deal of questioning of the old culture as well. It is not as if, uh, you know, the people of Delhi now, you know, Hali almost seems to suggest that, you know, there is this, it's it's a cocoon and people are, uh, you know, it's that old Mughal dominated culture that is there. You cannot have the East India Company in this period uh, you know, opening things like the East, the Delhi College and still hope that nothing has changed. It will not, that's not true. So there is a lot of questioning that is happening. And uh, Master Ramchandar is one person that I've mentioned. But even Ghalib is beginning to, you know, he has, uh, Ghalib, by the way, is one of the most forward-looking people that we have. So he is, uh, I mean, of course, he's a great a poet in the classical tradition, but he's open to all sorts of new things. He's talking about, in some of his letters, you find him saying, telling his shagids that, you know, in this day and age, you should use English English words in your poetry also. That's quite fine. I mean, you know, English is now uh, used in this country. Uh, when uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the loveliest stories of Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who was a young man uh, of Delhi at the time, and he wrote a uh, translation of the Aini Akbari, a critical edition of the Aini Akbari of, of Abul Hasal. And uh, he asked um, Ghalib to write a foreword. And of course, we, we are all very familiar with that because Ghalib is a celebrity. And if he writes a foreword to this book, it's going to sell well. So <laughs> Ghalib writes this foreword uh, in which he says, and it was in verse, it was in Persian verse. And he actually says, this, you know, this, uh, Honorable Sayyid has spent so much time on this outdated text of the Aini Akbari. Maybe you should have spent a little bit more time talking about all the wonderful new inventions he had now. Ghalib had been to Calcutta, hadn't he? Yeah. And, and on the way, he saw railways, he saw electricity, yeah. the telegraph. Um, and he's very enamored by all. And he saw Varanasi, which, and he loves, yes, Varanasi. Yes. Exactly. So, uh, so you know, that uh, th that kind of ferment that is there, we uh, we tend to... And, you know, it makes the picture so much more rich than these cliches that we've often been, uh, you know, handed out. So it is a interesting idea. Describe for those who, who, who don't know it, the poetic world of Delhi at this period, the, the Mushairas, the, the, what what would be the morning preparation for a mushara and what would then take place? Uh, I think one of the classic books that has been written on a imaginary mushara, by the way, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's fictional. Uh, it's called, uh, which was, it was later published in Likhi Akhri Shama, uh, the last mushara of Delhi. It's, it's in English, it's been translated in English also. Paratullah Beg. Yes, Paratullah Beg. And it talks about the Mushaira, the Mushaira was a institution, one of the institutions on which poetry flourished. Um, Urdu and Persian poetry in the classical tradition was something that you had to, you, you needed to learn through long years of immersion. You grew up appreciating it, appreciating it. If you wanted to write verses, you wrote a little bit, you went to an ustad, a master, whom you persuaded that person to become your, to see your verses. You showed your verses to that person, and that person, if they were willing to take you on as a shagird, as a, a pupil, they would correct your verses, give islam. So that, uh, it, that was one of the institutions. The other institution was that of the mushaira where all the ustads and aspiring ustads first presented their poetry in public. And that was like a, literally like a seminar for the hall. Because, and deeply competitive. Yes, it was. Because you present the share uh, uh, and it is then criticized. People will say, this is what you've got. Also, this thing of, of, of the, the meter being set in advance. 
And yeah. you have to, and you have to rhyme. So that often, so, often used to happen. So you know, uh, you have a tare, which is uh, the meter and the uh, rhyme scheme, etc., which was given by a line, uh, tarahi misra, and uh, so so those kind of those were the that that is the traditional mushaira that was there, and uh, poetry advanced under the guidance of these ustads, who, by the way, policed the mushaira, policed the whole ecosystem of the poetry but there too there was change and one of the um, major I think uh, factor for that change is the print revolution because from the 1820s and 30s there is a print revolution not only are these print newspapers are coming out uh, print journals are coming out there is a the Poetry, which was earlier available in very, very, you know, very only very few poets used to write a divan, which is a collection of their poetry. They, you know, very few had a body of work which was large enough to be compiled into a book. And those used to be handwritten. So even Ghalib's divan would have had a fairly small circulation. So much that, that after 1857, he actually loses many yes. verses, doesn't he? And, and he, can't, he said, I, 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 I can't, can't find, find anymore. Them. Yes. So... So the print revolution uh, changes this to lar a large degree. I mean, early print books were expensive. I mean, much more expensive relatively than they are today. But still, they were much more accessible than uh, the, uh, your uh, uh, manuscripts. But and at the same time, poetry was also disseminated through things like the newspaper. So newspapers invariably had uh, large chunks of poetry, particularly of the popular poets. Not only that, so... What is actually happening is there's a democratization of poetry. You don't necessarily have to have a daily contact with an ustad in order to become uh, proficient in this. You can be, you have greater access not only to the poetry of these ustads, you also have a slight, in, in time there is this idea that uh, analysis of poetry writing, its rules, what you should be writing, what are the, you know, what are the conventions of poetry, these, all these things are coming out almost in a manual form. So there is this great taskara of uh, Kadir Baksh Sabir, who actually gives a whole big manual in front. So somebody who doesn't have an ustad, an unthinkable earlier, now can write because they have this guidance that they, so these are revolutionary changes that are happening in so to go back into our Mushaira again, just to, to just again paint a picture. People are the princes are arriving, getting the seats of honor. Uh, they brought partridges, according to the Faratul Beg, that they keep up their sleeves, uh, <laughs> and they brought their pan. Yeah, uh, and then and then the then the the, the king uh, sends his own verb, which is read out for him. Out, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean one of the things Faratul Beg does. Faratul Beg, you must realize, is writing in the 20th century. And he is trying very much to um, paint a picture that will be interesting to his uh, readership and will, uh, you know, to recreate a supposed earlier age. And uh, one of the most, and so they, he concentrates quite a lot on the people from the palace, the princes who come for, for this Mushaira. Now, the Mughal palace, which is actually the Red Fort, uh, it's not really a fort, it's a palace complex. So therefore, the Mughal royal family, the extended Mughal royal family, a lot of the uh, men were also aspiring poets. In fact, there were a large number of them. They uh, they wanted to, they were aspiring poets, they uh, wrote poetry, they shared it at Mushairas, etc. And uh, Faradullah Beg um, then, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, describes how they come, what they do, etc., but you know, I would like to I'd like to go into something very different from this. Because Faratullah Beg actually based his Musaira on an actual individual. In Faratullah Beg's story, this the diving force is somebody called Karimuddin, who puts this Musaira together. Now Karimuddin was when was a real person. And he used to teach in the Delhi College. He was an alumnus of the Delhi College as well. He used to teach there. And he actually had no personal interest in poetry. He didn't write any poetry. He decided to hold this Mushaira as a marketing exercise to keep his printing press going. 
what he decided to do was he decided that he he rented a house he ran, rented a house he had fortnightly mushairas there he uh, and this was as i said a much more democratic thing there were very few ustads who came galib stayed away in the actual mushaira not faratullah beg switch no one but in the actual mushaira there were very few uh, of the greats who came the person he managed to get hold of was galib's nephew arif so that was the celebrity that he got hold of and he had these fortnightly mushairas and the uh, results of that mushaira the verses that were shared were and some of them were sent in by post also and of course mirza fakru sent in his uh, you know the the son of adur shah he sent in his verses as well and these were compiled and they were published as a sort of a in a fortnightly newsletter so he was actually trying to rescue his printing press so even this this uh, mushaira which uh, faratullah beg then turns into this uh, classic mushaira is in effect based on something that's very different I, I'm just going to read a little bit here for just to give an impression. We often talk with such reverence about this period that we often forget, in a sense, the the humor and often the roguery uh, of, of this world. Uh, so this is um, Galib when he hears someone praising the poetry of the very pious Sheikh Sabai, and he he answers straight back. He says, "How can Sabai possibly be described as a poet? He has never tasted wine." nor has he ever gambled. He has not been beaten with slippers by lovers, nor has he ever seen the inside of a jail, uh, which is a wonderful definition of what <laughs> And then there's just one other little thing I'll read, which is Garland's letter to a friend of his. This is Ralph Russell's wonderful translation. Um, and Garland is writing to a friend whose girlfriend has just died, and the guy's in mourning, he won't go out, he won't he won't come and uh, and he'd eat mangoes with with Galib at night and uh, he's gone and uh, uh, and locked himself away and and so eventually Galib after giving him a bit of time um writes some letters says you know put yourself together he says Mirza Saab I don't like the way you're going on in the days of my lusty youth a man of perfect wisdom counseled me abstinence I do not approve dissoluteness I do not forbid eat drink and be merry but remember the wise fly always settles on the sugar and never on the honey. I've always tasted, uh, I've always uh, acted on this council. You cannot mourn another's death unless you live yourself. Give thanks to God for your freedom and do not grieve. When I think of paradise and consider how, if my sins are forgiven to me, and I am installed in the palace with a hurry to live forever in that worthy woman's company, I am filled with fear and dismay. How wearisome to always find her there, a greater burden than a man could bear. The same old palace all of emerald made, the same old fruit tree to cast its shade, and God preserve her from all harm, the same old hoory on my arm. Come to your senses, brother, and take another. Take a new woman with each returning spring, for last year's almanac is a useless thing. That's gone. <laughs> So true, true, and it is all this um, this world that actually comes tumbling down in 1857. Lead us towards that. So we we we've started with a world where Octoloon and Fraser are joining in. They're commissioning the same uh, the the same pictures from the same painters. Garlib mourns Fraser's death. He says like the death of a second father. But then you get these much grimmer characters. These colder, more um, uh, judgmental characters, like, for example, you write a lot about Charles Metcalf. Do you want to give a little picture of him? Um, yes, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, of course, what begins to happen is that uh, slowly uh, this is this world is changing. And I think a major part of that change is the fact that um, the East India Company now is triumphant in North India. And it doesn't, that have, it doesn't have to yeah. mind its P's and Q's. It can do whatever it yes. likes. Yes. And therefore, it uh, slowly starts to, um, you know, put things in perspective. Say that we don't now have to pretend that we are we are ruling on behalf of the Mughal Emperor. So they start dismantling that whole... And uh, my book, I have talked about the process with which this happens and also the pushback. How What the Mughal Emperors try and do to try and hang on to... The, the so little things thing. like uh, forbidding them from giving out honours and yes. salats to yes. the and titles, etc. And the Mughal uh, emperors then trying to 
look back and follow, um, in fact, uh, uh, legal remedies through things like sending Akbar II, Bahadur Shah's father, sent uh, sent Ram Mohan Roy to Britain as uh, one thing we haven't dwelt on. Before we go into 1857, let's just talk about this for a second. Ram Mohan Roy goes, doesn't he go to a madrasa? Is he? Ram Mohan Roy is a very eclectic, uh, but yeah, just, let's yeah. talk about the relationship of Hindu and Muslim in this world. Um, yeah, again, we have, we have this very polarized view of We'll yeah, look at yeah, it yeah. today. How far is that true or not of this period? It is just such a complex thing that it is very difficult to sum up. But what I uh, would say, if you look at somebody like Ram Mohan, uh, in an era where everybody from the Marathas to the rulers of Bengal are using, for instance, Persian in their official lang as their official language, the uh, Mothers are teaching Persian, Arabic, all of that, rhetoric, logic, all of that is an important part of the education of anybody who aspires to uh, be a part of that service uh, network or, uh, or, or, you know, a good education, this is what it means. You, you study uh, Farsi uh, and all the other uh, things that go with it. So yes, uh, Ram Mohan is definitely that. And Akbar II, of course, has in mind the fact that Ram Mohan is well connected in Calcutta and could possibly have connections in Britain and therefore sends him there. Uh, Ram Mohan's mission fails and then Bhadal Shah in turn picks another different person and that is George Thompson. And George Thompson is actually an anti-slavery activist. So... Uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is a sort of a, a you know, the, the, the Mughals are trying to rescue the situation, not to turn back time. And that's, you know, the, you know in retrospect, we can say that's an inexorable um, the progression towards uh, full-scale, you know, uh, it is of the Mughals from the scene. And, uh, but, but, you know, they are trying their best to try and... Uh, you know, step within that. Yes, resist that. And these are the means through which they use, which they use. But you you then get more and more rudeness and insensitivity from the British residents as eighteen thirties gives way to the Yes, because food. now they don't they don't care. They're not even interested. I mean the resident stops visiting uh the Mughal Emperor, you know, doesn't don't bother to go there. They have already decided that once Bahadur Shah is dead they were to evacuate everybody from them. And one of them even takes his visitors in on horseback and yes. rides in when they improve without his permission. Yes, when he's all not. those uh, little things are happening. At the same time, the Mughal emperor still commands a lot of the affection of the Indian people around him. And uh, I, I uh, you know, there is, uh, he. one of the things that is very alarming to the British uh, East India Company is the fact that a lot of soldiers are actually coming to him and wanting to become his disciples. Because the Mughal emperor was also uh, supposed to have a lot of spiritual power. So they are coming and wanting to become his disciples and they say, please stop this. I mean, you know, you cannot be making disciples of our soldiers. So so there is this idea that the, there is something going on. Though there is no nothing like a full scale, uh, you know, conspiracy or anything, but you can see that there are these ties which are still surviving. And one of the other changes is that the East India Company now is letting the missionaries loose, and the missionaries are doing conversions. Uh, uh, Master Ram, Master Ram Chandra, Could Master Ram Chandra converts to uh, uh, yes, and uh, yes, some of that is happening much less than say Agra, for instance. But uh, yes, some of that is also happening. Jennings, whom you talk about a lot in uh, uh, the uh, last like astonishingly yes. sensitive clergyman, uh, yes. sets himself up in the Lahore Gate of the of, of the Red Fort, printing tracts against Hinduism and yeah. Islam, and then distributing them, which yeah. cause enormous event. Yeah. So those kind of things are, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, the reasons for 1857, of course, are very complex. But this is what leads to uh, uh, 1857 as it happens. I. Uh, and 1857, I think we don't need to go into it. I, I'm sure all the people here have read last ago. But I think I would uh, I would like to, and I'd like to read a little bit. One of the things that I have spent some amount of time on in this book is about a, 
a very interesting um, social, shall we say, almost a social revolution that is being foregrounded in the revolt of 1857. What happens very briefly is, of course, these soldiers from Meerut arrive in Delhi. Uh, Delhi soldiers join them. A lot of the townspeople rise up and overthrow the company's government. And Delhi becomes a center for the revolt. It becomes, becomes a center for a lot of youth soldiers who are mutinying all over North India, converging on Delhi. The figures are, are interesting. It's a, there's 139,000 sepoys in the Bengal uh, infantry. Yeah. Of those... Sorry, there's 106, there's 160,000 uh, the, in the Bengal infantry. 139,000 of those rise up, and 100,000 of those come to Delhi. Delhi, yeah. So this, uh, but what is happening with this? That there is, a, so let let me just just uh, you know, and I talk about what was happening, the what are the what is the ideology of the people who want to overthrow British rule, etc. So I'm going to read a little bit. Yet, it was not a mere revival of the old empire, no matter how glorious or how just and benevolent, that the new situation called for. Times had changed and even the emperor sought to adapt to these changed circumstances. On the 27th of July, the deputy Kotwal, the Kotwal was the uh, police chief, the deputy Kotwal addressed all the Thanadars to the effect that they had so far been addressing the emperor as Hazrat Jahapana Salamat. Your Exalted Majesty. Henceforth, they were to address him as Garib Parvar Salaman, protector of the poor. The revolt had opened up the possibilities of a changed worldview, of a world in which a ruler's right to rule would be tested on his ability and willingness to support the downtrodden. In these disturbed times, it was not clear which of the emperor's subjects needed the most protection. The burden of the war fell on all, of course, but there were some to whom it provided new opportunities as well. On the very first day of the uprising in Delhi, observers had noticed that the mob had played a big part in the violence and looting. This mob contained criminals such as pickpockets and thieves who had been released by the soldiers from the jail. It also comprised many of the non-criminal labouring poor, wrestlers, tanners, carriers of night soil, washermen, water carriers, butchers, green grocers, and beavers. It was not just looting they were interested in. The looting had led to a forcible redistribution of wealth and provided its receivers a chance for upward mobility. At least some of these newly liberated neighboring poor and criminal classes of the city got themselves horses, uniforms, and arms. They were so they become soldiers. There is a change. And what happens in the eyes of those who had long enjoyed social and economic privilege, the implications of this upturning of the social order were serious. They, there was a serious uh, concern that this was happening. For even when not armed, the poor were liberated by the newfound wealth that they had accumulated to plunder. Many stopped carrying out menial jobs. The newspaper, the Delhi Urdu Akbar, reported that the water carriers had stopped filling water in the houses. The sweepers and cleaners had all disappeared. And as a result, areas had not been cleaned for days. So there is this whole, uh, you know, a fear of a social revolution, which really actually is a major factor in scaring the rich. Uh, and ultimately... And, and we... Gale, for example, is very anxious about what's going on. Yeah. So a lot of them are. And uh, so... Uh, also, this comes across in some of the poetry that was written after the revolt. And um, it's, a, it's a genre called Sher-e Ashok. And the Sher-e Ashok poetry talks about the city that is destroyed. But this particular, and the, these, this was written in 1862. Just It was published in 1862, so just after the revolt. And I'm going to recite, give you a couple of uh, uh, lines from the uh, one of the Poet poems that was written by Muhammad Zahur, who writes, Sada tanur jhoke tha jo ladka naan bai ka, bara hai iske sar mein ab to sauda meer zai ka, karoli bandh ke nikle hai ab ladka kasai ka, ameero ke barabar baithe hai farzand dai ka. What he says is, the street cook's lad who did nothing but stoke the fire, 
Now he fancies himself a Mirza. The son of the butcher goes abroad wearing a hunting knife. The son of the midwife sits on level with noblemen. So the idea that there is this revolution that is happening is um, a very real uh, you so, talk, one of the characters you talk most interestingly about the book is uh, Mawzi Mohammed Bakr. Yes, Bakr is an interesting man. He's the uh, editor of the Daily Urdu Akhbar, the manager of the Daily Urdu Akhbar, and a major ideologue of the revolt. 1857, he is a major ideologue. And he's interesting because, I mean, we are running out of sort of time here also, but very briefly, he is the one who uh, I noticed very some interesting things that he talks about in the newspaper. He believed that he had this journalistic responsibility to assess what is going on in an objective manner. But one of the things he says is uh, it, it actually foreshadows Dadawai Nauruji's train of wealth. He One of his objections to British, uh, the East India Company is that, uh, you know, all uh, one of the examples he gives is that... Uh, Taxes are high and the salaries which are given to the British officials are high. So they are collecting all this money and they are sending it home. They are not spending it in India. And because they are not spending it in India, it is not creating wealth in, this, in the city. So uh, I think that's quite, quite interesting that he is coming up with these kind of uh, assessments of actually what colonialism is. It is. It's like sort of Edward Said, but written at the other end of the telescope with colonialism that is it's sort of beginning at it, yeah. to reach its height rather than at the end. Can I read my favourite, Zafar? Please, Zafar. This is um, when I was writing City of Jinns, I went to see Ahmed Ali, the author of Twilight and Delhi. Uh, in Karachi, and he gave me this um, poem that he'd done, which was, he sort of puts together um, all the various couplets of Zafar uh, into a sort of, almost like a sort of Tennysonian poem with a, with a wonderful rhythm. And I don't think it's probably the purest translation of Zafar you'll ever have, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, it sounds wonderful. So this is when the, the Great Uprising has reached its peak, been defeated. Uh, Zafar has come by boat down the Yamuna, given his uh, holy treasures to the shrine of Zamuddin just around the corner from us here, and then retired even closer to here to Hermione's doom uh, to give himself up. And uh, this is him uh, about to go into exile, um, sitting actually in, I think back in the Red Fort but in the stables now where he's been imprisoned and this is allegedly some of the verses that he wrote uh, uh, in imprisonment uh, dedicated to uh, his wife, his last and youngest wife Zinat Mahal when in silks you came dazzled me with the beauty of your spring you brought a flower to bloom Love within my being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, nor left my side. But now the wheel of time has turned, and you are gone, no joys abide. You pressed your lips upon my lip, your heart upon my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love again. For they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now give no ray of light. I bring no solace to heart or eye. Out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reigned, but its charms lie ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves, no prayers were read for the noble dead, unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh, the mind ablaze, the rising sigh, the drop of blood, 
the broken heart, tears in the lashes of the eye. But things cannot remain, O Zafar, thus, for who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the Prophet, all may yet be well. <laughs> Stephanie, you, in your last chapter, you paint a picture of what's left at the end of 1857. The world which you painted so beautifully in this book is, is lies in ruins. What replaces it? It's really, in some senses, all over for Delhi. But what I tried to talk about in the last chapter is about how that legacy lives on elsewhere. Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the Delhi College is destroyed. But Sayyid Ahmad Khan goes and founds an institution in Aligarh, which, and even apart from that, he founds a, a, a society for the pro promotion of scientific knowledge, uh, the translation of textbooks, all those kind of things. So that is the on somewhere. The poetry, the questioning of the literary tradition, I didn't have a lot of uh, chance to go into that, but that takes... Uh, now now settles down in the Delhi diaspora again, like Muhammad Hussain Azad and Hali in Lahore, where they start. Azad is, is now a sort of postmaster in Lahore, isn't he? Yeah. Him, he's taken his yeah. master's love yeah. verses, gets them bubbled. But that, that questioning that was happening is now transferred to Lahore. So, in fact, a lot of people have looked at these things without looking at this period in Delhi. And how many of the root seeds of what is going to happen are there in Delhi. And also in a different way, the, the Madrasa Rahamiya, which is the more orthodox Wahhabi Madrasa, seeds Deoband. Uh, okay, it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the two uh, scholars who have studied in Delhi uh, who go on and found uh, the Tarul Ulum in uh, Deoband. Yes, definitely they are coming from Delhi. So, so this whole... Uh, uh, you know, Delhi has this afterlife elsewhere, and Delhi then follows a completely different trajectory, which is not part of this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Swat Nabil. Okay, uh, we now open for questions. Uh, good evening and thank you. My name is Karuna. It was really insightful to hear. I just have uh, one question out of curiosity. Whenever we think about um, going down the lane of history, uh, there is always specifically talking of poets and intellectuals. We often hear the many achievements of men, but women don't seem to appear anywhere. Is it that in reality, they didn't take space publicly? Or is it that historians often tend to hear the stories as spoken by men instead of women? You know, in the intellectual life, yes, the fact is that no women went to the Delhi College. No women went to the madrasas, which does not mean that they were not educated, but they were educated at home. Like on the contrary, you see many miniatures of women being educated yes, with the old men were, coming. Yes, so all of that was there. I have actually written in my book, and again, you know, in a talk of this length, it is impossible to go into that. And I have talked about, for instance, the role of women in the palace. And these very strong women who are there, who are... Uh, you know, some of them are members of the royal family and uh, exactly how much agency they do have, but not in the same way. And uh, they often do not leave behind the kind of records and things that we have. Uh, 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 Octoloni's wife is a very interesting, Mubarak, me. Mubarak me. I, I've written about her and what she does. And, uh, you know, her uh, later, uh, you know, after she, she, uh, she becomes, uh, she, uh, Octoloni dies when she's still quite young. And who she marries later. So I do talk a lot about it. But as I said, there is it is difficult to get hold of. I have talked about the poetry that is associated with the women's voice, which is Rekti. But again, um, uh, that is a very different genre also because it's actually often written by men purporting to be in women's voices. There's some wonderful work though by Ruby Lau on, on Mughal women yeah. and Domesticity and Power by Ruby Lau is a Good starting point if you want to read more. So my name is A.K. Srivastava. Uh, we all know that uh, when Mr. Nehru was the Thadidar, we were the Thadidar in Delhi. 
in uh, around 1857. Now, was he appointed by the Mughal Emperor or by the British? Um, the Thanadas would have been appointed by the British. Um, thank you so much for this. I'm Vrinda. Uh, you spoke about poetry and uh, the print revolution during this period. I wanted to know if this opened uh, gates to certain kinds of censorship during the period and if yes, uh, what kinds of cen censorship and who had the power to censor poetry during this period? There was no censorship. I mean, literally, there's no, um, you know, uh, the East India Company's government is not really aware of, you know, first of all, there is not that kind of seditious uh, writing that is coming out at this point, which happens later, when you have your proscribed poetry, etc. So this is not the period for that. And there is no other it kind of... cut a certain amount yes. of censorship of newspapers, but you don't get to hear not, it. Not in there, yes. Good evening, my name is Sob uh, yeah. Huh. yeah. Um so you talked about how during 1857 and after 1857 there was this kind of forced redistribution of wealth and a new social order. Um so was there a degree of disillusionment amongst the masses with the old, you know, imperial order which had perhaps failed to protect Delhi from foreign invasion, like from Nadir Shah the Afghans and finally the British? No, I don't think, you know, people don't have memories that go back to Nadir Shah and all that. They, their concerns are much, much more in Egypt. And in this case, this is a question of getting an opportunity. You know, when there is this power vacuum and they have, uh, you know, they, ha they are seeing this opportunity to have a greater say because they have uh, gathered resources because of what has happened. So um, I would not imagine that this is that kind of thing. Yes, there are, um, th there are, uh, you know, there's this symbolic uh, rage against um, not only uh, the British government but against authority. You know, uh, uh, these underclasses have been, uh, you know, are used to keeping quiet, not saying anything, taking it, you know, and now they suddenly rise up and say, no more, we are not going to take this. So, because they have the opportunity. So, I, I think it's it's just that. Good evening. My name is Devashish. It's been a great conversation. I'm not a student of history, but I have interest in history. And I'd like to ask a question which dates to the 17th century, the Mughal reign. Because I thought, in my, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the decline of the Mughal Empire started after the death of Aurangzeb. And... Bef between 1707, when I think Aurangzeb died, and 1857, till Badu Shah Zafar was moved out, I think this 150 years is a very critical period, and it saw a rapid decline of the Mughal Empire. We had a lot of raids from foreigners, the Afghans, the Nadir Shahs, and so on and so forth. My question is that the East India Company, which saw the decline and was observing the decline of the Mughal Empire from 1707, decided to choose Bengal as the first point of entry into India rather than Delhi. Why was that so? What was the specific reason why they chose Bengal? Because they fought the Battle of Palassi in 1757 until they won the third one in 1776. They had not set foot in India. So why did they choose Bengal instead of choosing Delhi? That was the question. There wasn't a master plan. Um, there is a... Uh, the process that leads to Plassey is, is a very surprising one. Uh, the, a note is sent to the um, uh, governor of Calcutta that the French are about to attack, that there's been intelligence that the French can attack. The governor rebuilds the walls against the French, but Siraj Dawla, uh, who hasn't been consulted or his permission has not been sought, thinks it's against him, and he attacks the city for this uh, for this breach. The same bit of intelligence that led the British to build the walls up has also led to the dispatch of a fleet to, uh, to Madras in order to fight the French. The French are not there. They arrive, they've sailed halfway across the world, and there's no French fleet to fight. Uh, and at that note, by pure good fortune for Robert Clive, who's just arrived, a note comes saying Calcutta has, fought, has fallen. So they have a fleet which they're able to send to, to Calcutta. They recapture Calcutta. Again, they're about to go back because their job is done when a note comes from the Jagat Sets saying, we'd like, we'll give you a million pounds if you topple Sirajadana. And that's the process that starts 
It's just a whole series of accidents. There's no master plan for that. But it is a lucky thing for the East India Company that they capture Bougainville because that's where the money is. Uh, and today we don't think of Bengal as being a rich area of India. We think of Gujarat or Maharashtra or the Punjab. But in that period, there was a million looms producing huge quantities of high quality textiles. And that's what's keeping the moguls going at this period because the taxes get sent up through the jagged sets who take 10%. Uh, and then um, when, when the company captures it, all that money goes to company coffers. So it uh, the same wealth of Bengal, which powered the late moguls, then powers the company and, and underwrites its conquest. Hi, uh, so my name is Novel, and uh, you mentioned that initially there is a consensus for the Mughal state, especially among the local people who are sort of trying to cling to the cultural legacy of the Mughals. But at the same time, there is a change that is seeping in, especially with the British who are trying to end the Mughal sovereignty and uh, push for their own legitimacy. So my question really is, can we trace this change to the successor states? Who are which are set up in the shadow of the Mughal state, but are also trying to um, break away from that uh, cultural legacy and assert their own sovereignty, say through administration, etc. Uh, so very very briefly, uh, what you must realize is that the successor states have become viable successor states. They are no longer actually dependent on the Mughal Empire except in a very, very symbolic sense as drawing their, uh, you know, an, at a PR level, their uh, legitimacy to rule from the Mughal name. So therefore, they want that khilat, they want that title, etc. But, they, do, so but that, they don't send the taxes. Yes. They so they are not, they are not uh, actual vassals, but they are pretending to be because that is the ecosystem that is supporting that. So they have actually already broken over. They they are using the Mughal name for their own benefit in this way. So they have already broken through. What I describe in this period is when the British who have entered into subsidiary alliances with all these states and effectively subjugated them under their uh, umbrella of sovereignty, then proceed to dismantle that whole premise of Mughals being the fount of authority. So that is the process that uh, goes on in this period and is resisted by the Mughals. In 1832, they take yes. the, the emperor off the coins. And... Yes. And then, uh, of course, then once the successor states also realize that, uh, yes, uh, there is, uh, you know, the British are the ones who are... So the uh, Nawab of Awadh, for instance, uh, takes the title of Shah rather than just the, uh, you know, uh, he used to be the wazir of the empire. So uh, so all that, it, it's a... It's a that, Timing is different. Hi, uh, my name is Gautam Azarika. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. It was great hearing the two of you. Miss Little, I just finished your book. Fantastic book. Congratulations. Broken script. In that, uh, I think my question is a bit related to the young lady here. Uh, you talked about Octolony's successor, Seton, uh, trying to run away from the palace because the the queen wanted to give him a khilad and he was not allowed to accept it and... He was trapped into accepting it and then he had to write to his bosses in Calcutta explaining what happened to them. Can you, can you, I didn't quite get that properly. Was, what was that word? <laughs> well, uh, Seton, of course, uh, he's the... The Mughals were trying to... It's a very complicated story. But it's, uh, in effect, the Mughals were trying to uh, show that their... Or rather, Akbar II was trying to show and his wa uh, favourite wife, Mumtaz Mel, was trying to show that their favourite son, Jahangir, was the accepted heir. Now, the British had not accepted this heir, but they wanted to push him as the heir, so they engineered this thing. The Empress said, you know, I would like to adopt Seton as my son. And Seton, of course, cannot accept this without getting permission from Calcutta. So he tries to put it off, and then he is kind of... But they, you know, the, uh, you know suddenly he gets news that the Emperor is, is expecting him right away. So he has to go and present himself. And not only is he given uh, his uh, uh, daspare for Zandi, a turban of adoption is put on his head, but it is Mirza Jahangir who puts it on his head. And it is said in the newspapers, it is spread around that he has now been uh, appointed as deputy heir apparent because uh, Mirza Jahangir has been accepted as the heir apparent. So it's a very complicated uh, 
uh, it's a very complicated. It's it's a game of. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a later ep- round when and Seaton turns up outside the the fort and Mirza Jahan takes a shot at it. Yes, and knocks his hat, top hat off. <laughs> uh, and Mirza Jahangir then gets deported to Allahabad, uh, where he uh, dies drinking cherry brandy. <laughs> I belong to the Holkar state, but I was, I kind of went to school and university and things in Delhi. Now, I got the impression that the British East India Company and things did not want to tangle with Ranjit Singh. So, Delhi was kind of out of bounds. And the popularity of the of Bahadur Shah and, you know, that the fear and the ruler then. So it was actually Bahadur Shah and others, because of the atrocities that the Marathas committed in Delhi, that they went to the East India Company and actually invited them in. Uh, is that true, false? No, that is uh, not. Uh, and, and as far as uh, Punjab comes in, that's a completely different, I mean, you know, is I mean, it's true that the, the company didn't want to tangle with Ranjit Singh? Yes. And as long as Ranjit Singh is there, you, you, uh, the Punjab is completely yeah. safe. And Ranjit Singh brings in French Napoleonic generals who train up the Fujikas uh, and they can resist the company. And it's only when there's this succession of, of, of rulers that follow and the, and the court intrigue that the, the Punjab is open to, to bribery, corruption, divide and rule. Uh, and, and the two yeah. Sikh wars take place. That's true. Yeah, but yeah. there is no. Uh, uh, you know, the Mughals, Mughals, Mughals are. Uh, they just sit and wait and see what happens at this stage. <laughs> you know, they have very little agency. They have. I mean, they barely control the Red Fort. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, and they don't control even the city beyond. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, but what's extraordinary, what you bring out so beautifully in the book, is that despite that such is their charisma, such is the respect in which they're held, that they act as a catalyst for this extraordinary renaissance which you've been describing. The the amazing learning, the people coming to study here, the painters coming in, the poets. And so this city, even though the, the Mughals are technically bankrupt, they barely rule their own palace. Despite that, you have this extraordinary, what Percival Sphere calls this last flicker uh, in the flame of the, of the Mughal lab. And that's what makes this this period so exciting and what makes your wonderful book so worthwhile to read. Thank you.